Well, we only got through uh, the first verses of chapter 18 last week, and so we're going to pick it up at verse 10 of chapter 18 tonight. Jesus speaks to the disciples about how to deal with offenses uh, in verses 6 through the end of the chapter. In verses 6 and 7, he talks about offenses that cause other people to sin. In verses 8 and 9, he talks about internal desires and struggles that cause ourselves to sin. And you may remember, remember what he said as we were looking at last week? If you have a hand or a foot or an eye that offends you, do what to it? What did he say? You know, cut it out or cut it off. Uh, of course, we saw that he was speaking in hyperbole. It was an exaggeration. His point was there that we are to be radical in our pursuit of holiness. And we talked last week about that it is good, it's fine to have moral guidelines that help us walk in purity before God. It's great for, for individuals to have that. There's nothing wrong with that. The problem is when we begin to take those things that are our convictions and we expect other people to live by them as well. When we evaluate their walk with God and how spiritual they are, whether or not they're following the rules we've set for ourselves. That's called legalism. We can't do that, okay? So it's great that you have your guidelines, that you won't attend an R-rated movie, but don't judge somebody else if they watch an R-rated movie, okay? That's for you. That's between you and the Lord. And so there's so many other ways, of course, that we could apply that. Well, now we pick it up in verse 10. Again, the larger subject is offenses. And he says, take heed, that is, be careful that you do not despise one of these little ones. Now, let's just pause right there. Jesus delivered this lesson to the disciples right after teaching them on kingdom greatness. And to impart that lesson to them, he called for a little child and used this child as an example of what God is looking for. So children are still hanging around at this point, and Jesus refers to them now when he says, For I say to you that in heaven their angels always See the face of my Father who is in heaven. Now, in this entire section on offenses, there is the underlying theme of impending judgment. And Jesus really turns up the heat here. Besides God's omniscience, which knows who's bringing offenses, the angels are keeping watch and recording the affairs of earth. When judgment comes, there will be plenty of evidence from unimpeachable eyewitnesses who will give testimony to what has happened. In light of this, Jesus says that each of us need to take extra care so as not to cause those who are walking with the Lord to stumble. And then Jesus connects this tender carefulness to his own mission when he says in verse 11, for the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray. Does he not leave the 99 and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? And if he should find it, assuredly, I say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep than over the 99 that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father in heaven, uh, who is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish. Now, the point of this illustration is God's care for the individual who is in danger. His heart is to go after the lost and return them to the fold. And, and listen, that would be a great subject for an entire message, entire sermon, would it not? The heart of God caring for the lost. L let me just cut to the chase on that and, and encourage each of us. In, in light of what Jesus says here about God's heart for the lost, that we would be careful about the way that we speak about God's attitude towards sinners. The church today has produced a reputation for speaking very stridently towards certain kinds of sin. Would you agree with me? Let's not forget that Jesus Christ came to save sinners. What kind of sinners? All sinners. And we need to be careful when we start carving out certain sins and making them the boogeyman. Jesus Christ came to save all sinners from all sin. And God's heart is to go after the lost. So let's be careful when, when we speak about sin that we also convey that Jesus came to save sinners from their sin. 
before we move on, let's apply this personally. Do you know someone that used to be walking with the Lord, someone that used to walk with him, who today has gone astray? Is it God's heart to go after them? Well, how was he going to express that heart? Through us. May I encourage you this holiday season to begin to pray for that person that needs to come back to the Lord. Don't, before you do anything else, start praying for them. But then after you've prayed for them, may I suggest that you get in touch with them and just check in and just let them know, hey, listen, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. So many of us are going to go home for the holidays. Does God want them to come home for the holidays? You better believe it. To his home. So remember this statement of Jesus, that, that it's the Father's heart to go after the one who's straying, the one who's lost. Now, the next verses have been the subject of much study and frame the thinking of many reconciliation ministries. We've done sermons and studies on them here at Calvary Chapel when we've had to apply church discipline to erring members. I'm going to be far more summary with them tonight. We're going to cover the passage in an overview rather than getting into the details of how to apply all of this. The context here is a fellow believer who is in error and needs to be confronted so that he can repent and be restored to fellowship with the Lord and with his people. That's the context. Look at verse 15. Jesus says, Moreover, if your brother sins against, what? You, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. Pretty straightforward, isn't it? Note that the sin committed here is against the person who then confronts the offender. This isn't a sin that's committed against another person. This is an interpersonal conflict that needs to be dealt with. By the way, there are other passages that speak of dealing with a brother who was caught in a sin and the duty to go and to challenge him or her. But this is not that passage. So if the offender repents, great. You've done your responsibility. You've been restored. It's it's wonderful. Uh, But, verse 16, if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. Now again, the goal here is reconciliation. But the offender blew off the first encounter. So the confronter takes along another person as a witness and to impress on the offender the seriousness of the issue. If in the first encounter the offender acts hostile or coldly indifferent, it might be wise to take along one or two more. This is in line with Deuteronomy 19.15, which is quoted here. Jesus quotes which says that facts are established in a court case by two and preferably three witnesses. The addition of these others not only impresses the offender with the seriousness of the issue, but the idea is if he again rebuffs the attempt at reconciliation, well, now there are witnesses who can affirm the confronter's case. And then verse 17, and if he refuses to hear them, now, are y'all staying with me? Who's the them now? The first person and the two or three, or, you know, the one or two others that have come. So it's the three of them now, right? Okay. So if you refuse to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses to even hear the church, well, then let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Now, by the church, Jesus means the local body of believers among whom the offender has been fellowshipping. And most certainly among that church's leaders, that is the elders who exercise spiritual authority and would bear the responsibility of officially calling for the offender to be removed, disfellowshipped, excommunicated, whatever term you want to use. Jesus said at that point, the unrepentant offender is to be treated as someone who is lost. Now, how do we treat the lost? We love them, don't we? We pray for them. Do we shun and shame them? Never. We never do that. We love them. We pray for their repentance. But, listen, we don't serve them communion. You guys have been here on Sunday, for those of you that attend Calvary Chapel. 
What do I say almost every Sunday when it's time to take communion? It is for who? It's for Christians. It's for Christians. And I regularly remind people, before you take communion, examine your heart like Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 11. Don't eat unworthily because you can bring judgment on yourself. And so, what, what, so you see what he's saying here? This person must be disfellowshipped because they have rejected reconciliation. They're still in their sin. And so they need to be uh, removed from fellowship. That means you don't hate them, you don't shame them, you don't shun them in that sense. You continue the relationship by praying for them and being open to reconciliation to let them know you're welcome back. But they can't be allowed to partake of communion. They need to be told, listen, you're in sin. Don't do this because you're, you will be eating judgment on yourself, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11. Well, now Jesus takes this pattern for church discipline in dealing with interpersonal conflict, and he applies it to the disciples in their role as apostles who will lay the foundation for the church. In verse 18, he says, Assuredly, I say to you that whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Now, please understand that while these words are directed especially and specifically to the original disciples as they would become the apostles, what Jesus said in verse 20 makes it clear that they also bequeathed a spiritual principle for all believers at all times everywhere. And that principle is this. Agreement in prayer is crucial to advancing the kingdom of heaven. But we need to exercise caution here because some have taken what Jesus said way beyond its proper realm. He said, look at what he says. If two of you agree on earth concerning anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. And some have thought that anything means anything at all. Anything that they could imagine or dream up. No. By anything, Jesus means anything consistent with God's will. It is, after all, God who will do it. This is even clearer as we read in verse 20 when Jesus says, For where two or three are gathered together, what? In my name. I am there in the midst of them. The purpose, the reason these people have met together is to honor Jesus. They're all about advancing his kingdom and his glory. And the idea is that as they take counsel together around that, honoring Christ, Jesus makes himself present so that what they agree on is from him. And that's why the Father does what they agree on and establishes what they decide, because it's all for the glory of God and establishing his kingdom. Jesus is not saying here, if two of you or three of you get together, I'm there in the midst, and you can ask whatever you want, and my father will park a Mercedes in your driveway. He's not what he's saying. But did you know there are people today that are teaching that very thing? That this is a blanket promise. That, that whatever, anything that you can think of, if two of you will agree on it, but that the Father is bound to do it. Because you're manipulating the laws of faith. As though faith was something independent from God. As though it was some cosmic force. And that God was some cosmic bellhop that had to jump to do our bidding when two of us got together and agreed on the same thing. Well, that's not at all what Jesus is saying. We've gathered, what? In his name. And if we gather in his name, then it's all about his honor and his, his glory. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Now, in verses 21 through 35, uh, we read that wonderful story about the, the, the importance of forgiving. Remember, this whole section's on offenses, right? And, and, and so the importance of being forgiving. So three Sundays ago, we took a look at, at that passage and saw the, the imperative that we forgive the offenses that have been committed against us. And if you weren't here, this is such an important lesson for the followers of Christ. I would encourage you, if you weren't here, to get the, uh, the message from three Sundays ago on forgiveness. As we come to chapter 19, Jesus now moves south from Galilee. He eventually arrives in Jerusalem and his last week before the cross. 
But he makes a stop over by the Jordan River where he hangs out for a while. And it's understandable why he would. This was a resort area. Uh, it's a plain. The Jordan's running through this plain by the city of Jericho, which is known as the city of Dates. Uh, it's a beautiful, a lush area. It's, uh, it, was, it was a resort at the time. In fact, Herod had a special house there in Jericho that he return, uh, went to quite often. Um, and, and many of the people from uh, the region around Jerusalem would, would often go out uh, to this area. And it was, it was just a really nice place to hang out, a resort, a vacation area. And of course, Jesus is getting ready for his last week. And so he takes the disciples to this place. It's time for a little R&R. &R, and he takes the time that he's there with them to pour his most important lessons into now because they're about done. Their training is about finished. And so he, what he's going to share now with them is some very important stuff. Verse 1, now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these sayings that he parted from Galilee and came to the region of Judea by the Jordan. Uh, this was just a little sliver of land on the eastern bank of the Jordan River. As I mentioned, it's a, a warm, lush area, uh, kind of a resort area. Verse 2, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. Though Jesus was known primarily up north in Galilee, he had taken several trips south to Jerusalem over the previous three years, and he had become rather well-known there as well. When word got out that he was now in the area, people turned out in large numbers to get some of the goodness that they'd heard about him doing up in the north. And of course, the multitudes are turning out, and if they're coming, so are his critics. Verse 3, the Pharisees also came to him, testing him and saying to him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? Now, remember, these guys are ever angling to find some way to condemn Jesus as a lawbreaker. Or to see if maybe they can get him to run afoul of the Romans. Or to at least pull him down in the eyes of the people among whom Jesus was quite popular. Uh, in one of the Gospels, we read that the reason why the religious leaders went after Jesus was because they were jealous of him. <laughs> the common people had were hearing him gladly. They were coming out in large numbers to be taught by him and be touched by him. And these guys, quite frankly, were the, the limelight was off of them now. It was on Jesus. They were jealous. And that was one of the reasons why they opposed him. So here are the Pharisees. They're angling for a way to try to reduce Jesus's popularity by getting him to take a position that's not popular. You can imagine them just debating as they would meet together. Okay, how can we pull down Jesus? What can we do? And somebody came up with this idea. Well, let's ask him about divorce. They were just itching for a chance to ask him because they thought they had a question he couldn't answer. They assumed that because they couldn't answer this question. And here's why. Divorce was one of the hot potato issues of that day. There were two schools of thought each based on positions that had been articulated by two well-known and highly respected Jewish rabbis, one who was ultra-liberal and the other who was ultra, can you guess, conservative. Yeah. <laughs> the more things change, the more they stay the same, right? Rabbi Hillel was the liberal who said that a man could divorce his wife for virtually any reason whatever. For instance, a man could divorce his wife if she was a bad cook. Rabbi Shammai was the conservative who said that divorce was limited to strict conditions. That is, adultery or the inability to have children. Now, can you guess which view was more popular? Just, just take a guess. Yeah, the liberal view, of course, right? Halal's view was more popular. And the Pharisees hoped to get Jesus caught up in a controversy. They wanted to show people that he wasn't as different that, uh, than they were. That he had no better answer to the controversy over divorce. Now, there were a lot of lessons that we could glean from this, uh, just to this point in the story. But let, let me narrow it down to this. This debate over divorce in the first century was to, due to two very different ways of interpreting Scripture. The rules of divorce were found in Deuteronomy chapter 24, which says, if a man takes a wife and marries her, 
And it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some uncleanness in her. And he writes her a certificate of divorce and he puts it in her hand and sends her out of the house. Then they're divorced. Okay? So the bill of divorcement was a simple one-sentence statement that the husband dismissed his wife. So he could literally just take a piece of paper, write on it, I divorce you, and hand it to her. And they're divorced. Okay? But, but what was the condition? She had to find no favor in his sight because he had found some uncleanness in her. And that's where the debate centered. What does that mean? How was the phrase some uncleanness to be interpreted? Now, on this point, the rabbis were violently divided. Rabbi Shammai and his followers held that by uncleanness, Moses meant only fornication. That's it. Either she was an adulteress or she had claimed to be a virgin when they were courting and when they got married, turns out she wasn't. Okay, so she had had sex before marriage, premarital sex, and not with him, but with somebody else. And so that was the uncleanness. Now, that's what Rabbi Shammai said. Rabbi Hillel and his followers held that the meaning of uncleanness in the widest possible sense, equating it as anything that would raise a feeling of dislike in her husband. They said that a man could divorce his wife if she put too much or too little salt in his food, if she incessantly twirled her hair, or went out of the house without first putting it up under a veil. If she spoke with another man in the street, or if she spoke disrespectfully uh, to, of his parents. <laughs> if she argued with him or raised her voice so that she could be heard by the neighbors. Then he could hand her a piece of paper that said, I divorce you, and that was the end of the marriage. Now, one of Hillel's major disciples, Rabbi Akiba, went so far as to say that the phrase, if she finds no favor in his eyes, meant that a man could divorce his wife if he found a woman that he liked better. Because then his wife would not stack up so well. So, just imagine how absurd this became. To complete the picture of divorce in Jesus' day, we need to know that there were two cases in which divorce were compulsory. In other words, you had to divorce. And that was what Rabbi Shammai said. If there's a case of adultery or the inability to have children, then uh, it was demanded that you divorce. And if after 10 years of marriage, there were no children, again, a couple had to divorce. So you understand when the Pharisees put this question to Jesus, it was with all this interpretive baggage and an entire society that was polarized into two camps with very differing ideas. Which side is Jesus going to take? Can you guess? Which side is Jesus going to... Is, no, is he going to take the liberal side? And, 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 and of course, you know, here we are, evangelical Christians. Is he going to take the liberal side? <laughs> no, right? Liberal. Ah. <laughs> That's a boogie word. Is he going to take the conservative side? Guess what? He takes neither side. Jesus sides neither with Shammai nor Hillel. He sides with the word of God, which had been madly, badly misinterpreted and ignored. Verse 4. And he answered and said to them, Have you not, what? Read? You guys are depending on the, the opinions of a couple of rabbis. Why don't we get out our Bibles and take a look at what God said? Amen. How much of what we believe today are the traditions of man? Why don't we look to God's word and see what God's word says? I'm all for that. Have you not heard or have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? Well, there's, there, well, let's just pause right there. We're talking about divorce here. But what's our culture talking about today? Anybody heard anything about that gender debate thing that's going on in our culture right now? God made them male and female. Society doesn't get to tinker with that. Gender is not plastic. Gender is not flexible. Gender is something God created. 
male and female. Okay, let me get off my soapbox. <laughs> Verse 5, And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then, they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. The whole controversy on divorce rested on what Moses meant in Deuteronomy 24.1. Jesus answered them, not by interpreting Deuteronomy 24, but by going back to the very beginning and the passage which first defined marriage, which was Genesis chapter 2. God gave the prescription for marriage there at the creation when, he, when we read that human beings were created male and female so that they might be brought together in a singular commitment in which they, as two individuals, are joined into an essential oneness that is unbreakable. God intends marriage to be a lifelong commitment and relationship in which a man and a woman experience oneness with each other in every level and dimension of their being, body, soul, and spirit. And Jesus makes it clear. What God intends in the oneness of a husband and a wife, no one is to work contrary to. This response stunned the Pharisees. They just couldn't process it against what they thought Deuteronomy 24 said. And so they grill him, verse 7. They said to him, Why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? Do you see what they're doing? They're tipping their hand here. They thought that there were certain cases where divorce was compulsory. But the law never demanded divorce. And Jesus now makes that clear. Verse 8. He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. Note carefully what Jesus reveals here. He says that Moses' instructions in Deuteronomy 24 have to be interpreted and understood against the higher principle of marriage laid down in Genesis 2. Marriage is a covenant of companionship. The only violation of marriage of the marriage covenant that might sever the God-ordained bond of marriage is sexual immorality, adultery. Jesus says that Rabbi Hillel's liberal view that divorce was permissible in just about any case is wholly wrong. But Rabbi Shammai is also wrong because while he correctly identifies uncleanness as sexual immorality, he was wrong in saying that divorce was required. Divorce is a concession. It's not a requirement. It's a concession for those whose hearts cannot let go of the pain and the hurt inflicted by infidelity. Over the years, I, I've talked with um, several people whose mates have cheated on them. Adultery is brutal. It's brutal. The violation of trust is crippling. I've talked with a lot of people now over the years. Often called right into the midst of it. You know, when one of them has just discovered that their, their, their spouse is cheating. And then walking with a couple through the process of whether they're going to end in divorce or they're going to be reconciled. And there comes a point in, in working with a couple where you have to face this reality. There is the offender and there is the offended. There's the adulterer and then there's the spouse who's been faithful but has been sinned against. If the person who has committed adultery repents, breaks off the relationship demonstrates genuine repentance and says, I, 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 I'm sorry, please forgive me. That mate, as we've seen, right, does, that, does the mate need to forgive? Yes, absolutely. That's an imperative. You have to forgive. Is that mate required to reconcile? The answer is no. Are they required to divorce? What did Jesus just say? No. But they do have the option of divorce. Why would they choose that option? Well, let me ask you this question. 
How crucial is trust to a marriage? How crucial is trust to any relationship? You can, you, there is no relationship without some level of trust, right? The most intimate relationship that two people can have is marriage. So it is the relationship that requires the greatest amount of trust. And the fact of the matter is some people are able to not only forgive, but to say, I'm willing to reinvest trust in you. Now, there's going to take a process here. You're going to have to prove that you are worthy of that trust, but I will give my trust back to you. That marriage can continue. But there are some people that simply cannot come to that place of letting go and trusting that, that, that person. And in that case, God says, it would be better to divorce. Because now imagine a marriage where you have two people living together and trying to have a life together where one of them doesn't trust the other. It doesn't work. Because marriage is a covenant of companionship. Trust is required or there is no companionship. So that is why Jesus says that a divorce is allowed in the case of adultery, but it is not required. It's about this issue of trust. Can it be reinstalled? Then Jesus speaks to the situation of his day and the culture or any culture that takes a liberal and easy attitude to, to divorce, when he says in verse 9, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. Please hear me, because I know this can get a little confusing, so, so please hear me clearly, and if this isn't clear, I apologize, see me afterwards, and I'll try to uh, explain it as clearly as possible. In God's eyes, may I say to this point in Scripture, Paul is going to add another condition that allows for divorce when he gets to his letter to the Corinthians. But that's a study for another time. Forget I said that. Okay? <laughs> to this point in Scripture, there's only one legitimate reason for divorce, and that is what? Adultery. If a couple separates for any other reasons and then uses the legal means of the day to formalize their divorce, we need to understand that in God's eyes, they are still married. So in California, we have what's called no-fault divorce. You don't have to show any condition. You don't have to have any reason for your divorce other than, yeah, we just don't want to be married anymore. And, and people can divorce. Now, listen. Listen. In God's eyes, they, they, they can go to the court. They can get the certificate. They can split up their property. Did you know that in God's eyes, they're still married? It doesn't matter what man says. God made them one. And that's why Jesus said, what God has made one, let not man, what? Separate. They're still one. And that's why Jesus says here, so then if they go and they marry somebody else, what are they doing? Committing adultery. Which, in fact, breaks the first marriage, does it not? But the point is they're complicating their lives by adding more sin. Now, I realize this isn't very popular because this could be really convicting right now. This is the way it is. This is the Word of God. This is the way it is. Jesus said this because in his day, people divorced and remarried with abandon. Despite the much-touted Jewish high view of marriage and family, the fact of the matter was serial divorce and remarriage was a common practice. God was grieved over the casual way that people treated the sacred blessing that he intended for marriage. And Jesus wanted them to understand that just because a man wrote his wife a bill of divorce, that didn't mean in God's eyes they were in fact divorced. This is something that God's people would do well to heed today since attitude towards marriage, divorce, and remarriage is even more liberal and messed up than it was in Jesus' day. Now, one more thing. Some people think that the last phrase of verse 9 stands alone. Notice what he says there. Jesus says, whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. And they assume this means any divorced woman is committing adultery if she remarries. Please understand that the grammar here does not allow that interpretation. The last phrase connects to the previous half of the verse. In other words, divorce due to adultery severs the bond of marriage, not just for the husband, but for the wife as well. 
parsing the grammar correctly, it's, we, should, we should read or understand verse 9 this way. Whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery and, and then this is where you need to add that phrase, except for sexual immorality, whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. Okay? So now, to the people of Jesus' day, he's just come off as sounding even more conservative than Rabbi Shammai. Jesus was concerned with elevating marriage to the place of sacredness intended by God, but had been forgotten by the people. And he meant to elevate the, the woman and wife in the home in marriage to a place that God had originally intended for her, but denied by the men of that day. A wife was to be cherished as a vital part of her husband's life and heart not treated as an object to be used, which is the way women of that day were esteemed by men. This radically new perspective on marriage not only knocked the Pharisees backward, it stunned even Jesus' own disciples. Look at what we read next. Verse 10. His disciples said to him, Well, if such is the case of the man with his wife, it's better not to marry. (laughs) They're like, well, forget that. Now, please, again, understand this in light of the popular views on marriage and divorce. When a guy grew tired of his wife, he could ditch her and take out another. Jesus said, no, following me means obeying God, and God intends marriage to be one woman for life. And that life is a mutual sharing where the wife isn't just some object that you use, but you become one with her and she with you. To this, the disciples respond with a classic reaction. We'll forget marriage then. And this gives us, do you understand? This gives us a peek into how women in marriage were esteemed by men in that culture. If marriage is a lifelong covenant of oneness, they conclude it's better not to marry. And Jesus now replies to that, verse 11. But he said to them, all cannot accept this saying. That is what the disciples had just said, that it would be better not to marry. That remaining single is preferable to lifelong marriage. He says, he said to them, all cannot accept this thing, but only those to whom it has been given. What? That what's been given? Staying single. And then he says, for there are eunuchs who were born thus from their mother's womb, and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He was able to accept them, let him accept it. Now, please understand Jesus' words have to be understood in their context, which he himself sets by quoting Genesis 2. Verses 1 through 11 teach us that it's God's general will that men and women marry and that they do so in a single and exclusive covenant of companionship for life. God looked at that first man, and even before sin came, he said that it was not good that the man was what? alone. The remedy was a mate of flesh and bone, a companion who was comparable to him. The relationship that God sanctioned between them was marriage. So marriage is God's general will for men and women. But there are exceptions, and Jesus makes them clear. Some people are called to a life of committed singleness and celibacy. He said that there are a few that are born to remain single. How would they know? How how would a person know that they're called to be single? Well, their desire for companionship is satisfied by regular friendships. Their sexual drives and needs are of such a nature that they don't put a stress or a challenge on their morality. For such a person, marriage would be a burden. They'd probably make a poor spouse because their need for relational intimacy was small. Other people are made eunuchs by man. What Jesus is referring there to the practice of some societies of the ancient world. There were guards who protected the harem. They were close to the king's throne. And they were made eunuchs by a surgical procedure which caused the sexual urge of such men and the driving ambition that might endanger the king to be removed. The final class of people Jesus mentioned are those who whose desire for companionship is satisfied in their wholehearted pursuit of serving God. Jesus ends with, and, and I love this, he says, he who is able to accept it, let him accept it. Meaning, if celibacy is what the Lord has appointed you to, then be faithful to it. 
If not, don't sweat it. Now, how do you know if you're called to marriage or celibacy? Simple. Listen, this isn't a mystery. This should be a mystery to no one. By the way, if you're already married, <laughs> let me tell you right now what God's will is to be married. All right? Don't you dare be thinking, yeah, maybe I should be single. <laughs> maybe I missed my calling. Yes, you did. You're married, you stay married. <laughs> but what about, what about if you're single? Well, he, here's the deal. Do you long for compa- romantic companionship? Do you want intimacy, emotional, social, physical, and spiritual intimacy with another human being? Then guess what? You're supposed to be married in God's timing. I, I See, I have to be very careful about how I parse my things. Pastor said, you know, <laughs> will you marry me? He said tonight. Yeah, I heard him in study. <laughs> I just happen to have a ring in my pocket. <laughs> but, but you singles, uh, you singles that, that uh, you long to be married, I, I, want, I want you to know, I, I really do, I want you to know, yeah, if you have a desire to be married, you really do, um, then, then you know what? God, God wants you married. But, but now, give that to him and let him lead you to that mate in the right time. G- a good marriage is a little slice of heaven on earth. A bad marriage is a little slice of hell. Bet- <laughs> better, better, better to not be married and single and know that pain than to be in a marriage that is a nightmare and to know that pain. Please trust me on that. In fact, can I get an amen? Amen. Uh, That that, that is, you need to hear that. The the pain of loneliness is much easier to bear than the pain of a brutal marriage. Please hear that. Wait on the Lord. He'll bring you that mate. If he wants you married, I mean, you can say, I'm supposed to be married. I just know that. Okay, well, the Lord will bring you that mate in the, t- in the right time. Don't show, sell yourself short. Wait for the Lord's timing. Verse 13. Then little children were brought to him that he might put his hands on them and pray, but the disciples rebuked them. <laughs> you disciples. Have, are, don't, are they not listening? Are they not? It's, it's like, you got to wonder sometimes if Jesus isn't sitting there and he's watching the disciples shoo the, the kids away. And he's like, you knuckleheads, didn't we? A half an hour ago, didn't I just put a little kid here and say the kingdom of heaven is like this? Let's see. And now you're, you're shooing the kids away? You guys. <laughs> but Jesus said to them, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them for of such is the kingdom of heaven and he laid his hands on them, and then he departed from there. Besides being a tender and moving scene, this is such a crucial moment in Jesus' ministry. As I mentioned, you know, just there at the beginning of chapter 18, Jesus had called for a little child and set him in the midst of the disciples and has said, guys, this is what the kingdom of heaven's made of, like this. And this is what you're to be like as you fall. So he uses another child to... These, these children that are being sent away to repeat this lesson. If you want to have some fun, watch little children around adults. While some children aren't in the least intimidated by big folk, others will cower away. And sometimes it's the demeanor of the adults that affect the response of kids. Some adults exude a sense of power that's frightening to a toddler, but other adults are warm and they're open and kids just swarm them. Have you noticed that? We see this with people who sign up to help out with uh, the kid in the classrooms downstairs, the, the toddlers, the, kid, the kids that are just, they're barely walking, you know. And we'll have people that'll sign up, they want to help out in the church, and so they'll sign up to work out with the toddlers, and they'll walk in the room, and, you know, they walk in. I'm here. What do I do? You know? And the kids are like, ah! <laughs> and then there's other people that come in, and they know, man, best thing to do Get down on those kids' level as quick as possible. You get down to eye level. You just, do you want to, you're working in the nursery? You're working with the toddlers? Best thing to do is get down at eye level with them. When, it, when, a, when an adult does this and picks up toys and starts, what do the kids do? They're all over you. 
they're coming and they're just climbing all over because you're getting down to their level. You show that you're not going to stand up and be all intimidating. They, they're, oh, you look, you're, you're, you're my height now, you know? You're playing with toys. I play with toys. And we're, they, you identify with those kids. You get right down with them into their world and look them in the eye. And this is what God did. He didn't come to earth, you know, all big and us having to look up at him and all awed by his glory. He came down into the very midst of our humility. He, he, he came through the womb of a teenager, and, and his first crib was a feeding trough. And now, as the disciples are, are trying to shoo these kids away, Jesus says, guys, don't you get it yet? How, don't you got, haven't you picked this up from me yet? I, I, I'm not one who's too important for children? Bring them to me. And you know that Jesus took those kids and put them in his lap and, and put his hands on them and prayed for them that God would bless them. The reason the parents did this was because it was the regular practice for when a rabbi came to town, Rabbi's the holy man. You know, you bring your kids and he'll bless them. and Hopefully the favor of God will rest on them. And So here's Rabbi Jesus and the parents come with the kids and the disciples are, no, Jesus is too important for that. He, he had to correct them. I'm not too important for that. Guys, this is why I've come. This is what the kingdom of God is about. May I encourage you adults um, that are looking for a place to plug in to consider ministering to the kids. In, in most churches, there's an unending re request and plea for people to help out in the children's ministry. And of course, we, we always have openings because we like to have a lot of people so that one person doesn't have to do it forever and ever and ever. We like it. We have a rotation. And uh, we, we are blessed with all of the people that are involved in children's ministry here. And you know what? I would just say, it doesn't matter how many we've got, there's always room for more especially men. I love to see men teaching the kids. Well, verses 16 through 20 is the story of the rich young ruler, which we looked at a couple of Sundays ago. If you weren't here again, get a copy of the message in the bookstore after study tonight. As Jesus watched that rich young ruler walk away, we read in verse 23, then Jesus said to his disciples, assuredly I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And when his disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished, saying, well, who then can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and he said to them, with men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. You know, <laughs> Jesus uses an illustration here that has been terribly misinterpreted in recent years. Somehow, it has crept into the tradition and teaching on this passage to say that there was once a tiny gate in the wall of Jerusalem called the Eye of the Needle. And the only way that a camel could get through this gate was by taking off its saddle and any of its baggage and making it kneel down, and then you would have to push it through <laughs> this little gate. Problem is, there was no such gate. And Jesus never meant for such an interpretation to be used here. Please understand, he's not just saying that it's hard for a rich man to enter heaven. He's saying it's impossible for him to get to heaven by his own works. That is, by the route the rich young ruler has just tried to make for himself. It would be easier to pass a camel through a sewing needle's eyelet. Now, listen, you can get a camel through the eye of a needle. You just have to grind them up really, really fine. <laughs> Camel smoothie. The disciples were stunned by this statement of Jesus. Because until they started following him, they were of the same frame of mind as the rich young ruler. Like all the Jews of their day, they thought eternal life was something that you proved yourself worthy of by doing good works. And God showed his approval of people 
and that they were indeed on the path to heaven by blessing them with material prosperity in life. So the rich were assumed to be heaven-bound. But here Jesus nukes that idea when he said, it's hard for the rich to get into heaven. If it's hard for them, everyone else is out of luck. But Jesus doesn't leave the entrance to heaven as just hard. He ramps it up into the impossible category when he speaks about camels and needles. What Jesus wants the disciples to understand is that they have salvation all wrong. It's not a reward for good works. Heaven isn't their destiny after living a holy life. In short, it is impossible for a man or woman to earn salvation. But what is impossible with God, uh, with man, is supremely possible with God. You see, it was the time in Jesus' ministry as he is now headed to Jerusalem to die to make sure the disciples understood that salvation isn't a reward God gives us for our work. It's a gift he gives because of Christ's work. We don't do the work and earn eternal life. Jesus does the work, and the reward that God gives him is giving us eternal life. Verse 27, then Peter answered and said to him, See, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? Poor Pete. Because it's like Pete has not even heard that last paragraph. Because remember back, come on now, remember back to the story of the rich young ruler. Uh, master, rabbi, what do I do to have eternal life? Well, keep all the commandments. I've kept all the commandments. Well, okay, then do this. Go sell all you have, give to the poor, and come and follow me, and then you will have eternal life. And the rich young man went away sorrowful, for he had many possessions. And then Jesus says, you know, it's really hard for the rich to get into heaven. In fact, it would be easier to pass a camel through the eye of a needle. And, 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 then, and then Pete says, look, look, see, we've left all and followed you. What then shall we have? It's like he didn't even hear what Jesus... Do you ever do that? Do you ever hear somebody say something and then your mind kind of spins off on its own little journey and you don't hear the next paragraph or two? Does that ever happen to you? It happens to me all the time. What was I just saying? Lord, as he's watching the rich, rich young ruler go away, Lord, we've left all. What do we get? Verse 28. So Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Jesus knew that Peter would come round and realize that salvation is by grace through faith, not merit, not good works. It would take the cross and the resurrection before these things would become clear to the disciples. But to Peter's query about what role the disciples will play in his kingdom, Jesus says that they will indeed have a unique place. When he takes his throne and establishes his kingdom on earth, they will each have a throne with an assignment to assist in the administration of his millennial kingdom. They are going to have some role in adjudicating the life of Israel during the millennium. And we don't know what that is, but it's what the disciples will be doing. Verse 29, and everyone who has left, now he's going to extend that beyond the 12, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. While the Twelve disciples have a unique assignment in the coming kingdom. All those in every age who define their lives by their relationship with Jesus rather than worldly success will partake of a glorious eternal reward. And what we will gain in heaven far surpasses anything that we've given up here for the sake and the cause of Christ. Please understand that when Jesus says they'll receive a hundredfold, he's not speaking literally. I mean, because think about what that would mean. He's, look at what he says, verse 29. Everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children, if you will receive a hundredfold, who needs a hundred husbands? <laughs> who wants a hundred kids? 
He's not speaking literally. What he means is all of the satisfaction and all of the joy and that these relationships bring to us are going to be multiplied a hundredfold. Please hear me. Please hear me. Everything that your heart longs for, truly longs for, sin has tweaked it. But the core of that longing is given to you by God that you would seek him and find your satisfaction in him. And heaven is the fulfillment of every longing and every desire your heart has ever known. And here's the thing. The satisfaction that we will enjoy in heaven will last eternally. You know, you, you're hungry now, and you think, oh, man, some of Rosa's tamales would be really good right now. Mmm, want that tamale. Uh. And you eat that tamale, and, and then another, and another, and after six tamales, you're like, okay, I'm done. The need, the craving, the desire for the tamales is over. In heaven, heaven is a place where every longing, every desire, the truest desires of our heart and our being, will be satisfied and continually satisfied. Continually. And there's no waking up with a hangover. There's no downside. There's no adding pounds. There's no disease. There's no downside. It's all life and more abundantly. Forever. Next time you're tempted to compromise with sin, just remember what God promises your obedience. No one's given up these things on earth that you won't receive a hundredfold of that in glory.